Good day to everybody. It's Adrian Kerr here um, to give a, a televised talk. Today our subject is alcohol, a 9,000 year love affair, both good and bad news coming up. So let's investigate together the, the background to not only the name but also when it originated and then the, some of the positives and negatives that impact on us today. So off we go. Um, the name itself goes back to ancient Egypt, um, and if you remember, the ancient Egyptians tried to protect their eyes and faces from the very bright sunlight, and they used a ton of makeup, and Elizabeth Taylor here was accused of having far too much makeup on when she was doing her uh, movie Cleopatra, but in fact, it was very understated. The Egyptian men and women both applied makeup to their faces um, much more extensively than you can see in this image of Elizabeth Taylor. But uh, to make makeup, of course, is a chemical process, um, and uh, the black makeup to protect around the eyes, underneath the eyes, like quarterbacks use today, um, it was a material called coal, and it was made out of a toxic product, which was tin oxide and possibly lead oxide. Um, but remember, in those days, the ancient Egyptians only averaged about 25 to 28 years of age, so the toxic effect of the, of the cosmetics was never going to affect their life expectancy. Um, but the name of the makeup was called coal, um, and uh, in Arabic that became the word alcohol, and from alcohol we get the name alcohol. Um, in the period of the um, Moorish expansion from North Africa, post Muhammad's death into Spain, um, the Moors in Spain um, used the name um, alcohol for a number of substances, particularly anything fine powder, any material for cosmetics. Um, a hundred years later, um, it somehow transferred its uh, meaning to um, distilling spirits from wine. As you know, um, um, you remove water from wine and you get a more concentrated alcohol. And this process became known as alcohol. Um, and then a hundred years later, again, it became standardized. So it had morphed from a chemical process in ancient Egypt for making uh, makeup to a spirits, high alcohol containing liquor. What do we use alcohol for? Um, of course, beverages um, very common, um, and they range in alcohol content from weak beers around three percent um, up to up to forty percent in some of the stronger liquors. Um, and uh, we measure alcohol content by um, d detecting the ethanol. Um, concentration. There are two types of alcohol. There's methanol, uh, which is uh, very seriously uh, affecting humans uh, and make, make you blind and can kill you. Methanol um, is not suitable for drinking, but ethanol, its cousin, um, makes up the um, alcoholic part of drinks. Um, if you go on the Caribbean cruises, you'll go to some of these wonderful islands in the Caribbean and uh, many of the islands have switched now from, from growing sugar, because it's no longer um, effective price-wise, to the extract of sugar um, turning into rum. And the Caribbean rum uh, distilleries will entice you with alcohol levels of 90%. 90% alcohol as opposed to proof, and this is very, very highly concentrated. Um, if you drink this uh, more than a thimbleful, uh, it'll paralyze your uh, sensory organs in your mouth for a few minutes. So 90% al alcohol is uh, very serious indeed. Of course, there are other than domestic use. Um, the most common use of alcohol uh, is in um, use for antifreeze and 50% of the material that you put into your uh, radiator to stop it freezing in winter is ethylene glycol, um, and uh, that's de derived from alcohol. Um, it's also, alcohol is used for disinfectants, and we now see it used in san sanitizers, and particularly during the current plague, um, that has grown and grown in terms of uh, production and consumption, and it all contains a certain amount of alcohol, because alcohol kills simple germs on contact. Um, we also use alcohol in medical um, use. Here we do it for, um, for, for maintaining specimens, stopping from going bad. Um, and so we see also used in biological labs and hospitals, alcohol is used to prevent these uh, specimen going bad. Um, of course, it has a nicer use. Um, the common use of alcohol um, in 
and solvents is particularly a given example of perfumes. Um, so when you have a perfume, you spray it, it's the alcohol that is um, evaporating and gives that cooling effect. Uh, solvents also used in drugs, of course, as well. So we're saying overall, as well as drinking alcohol, it's used extensively in industry, medicine, and so on. And more recently, alcohol has grown in interest from the point of view as a fuel for an internal combustion engine. Um, the beginning of this trend was in Brazil, which is a lot, one of the largest producers of sugar, and one of the byproducts um, that you can make, of course, is uh, uh, sugar alcohol. Um, and uh, they decided to use this for gasoline as an additive, as a spreader, um, because Brazil was importing crude oil to make gasoline, why not use sugar? And so the product is called bioethanol, because ethanol, of course, is the alcohol that, that we know well, and it's made from crops, from sugar. It can be made from other crops as well, but Brazil had a surplus of this material, so they started putting uh, bioethanol into their gasoline blends. Um, it also can be made out of corn, for instance. Um, in, in the United States, um, the corn produced in the Midwest is used to produce ethanol, bioethanol. Um, and E, if you ever see the word E on a gasoline um, a pumping station, then that E refers to the percentage of ethanol in the gasoline. And 10% is quite common. So E10 stands for 10% of that stuff that you're pumping into your car is ethanol. Um, in some areas in the Midwest, particularly where the, um, the bioethanol is produced, um, it goes up in percentages to a very high level. The highest in the United States currently is 85% alcohol. Um, so the normal range at the highest level is somewhere between half and 85% of the liquid that you put into your tank um, to start run the engine is made out of bioethanol. And in fact, there's a company which is now expanding their um, operation to make bioethanol by a new process, which is using um, naturally occurring algae um, and carbon dioxide and warmth, hence being based here in um, Florida. And it produces, uh, the bugs produce eth ethanol as a byproduct, and that is skimmed off, and distilled, and can be used as fuel. So there's a growing uh, interest in biofuels based on ethanol. number of reasons. One is it stops in, um, bringing in foreign oil, um, but it also makes less, producing, less, less pollution, um, so the ozone production from combustion engines is less using bioethanol. It helps the farming industry. Demand for corn has gone up. Um, I mentioned it reduces the oil inputs. Um, but you have to remember that this is uh, um, a lower uh, calorific value than gasoline. So you will get less miles per gallon out of a uh, mixture of gasoline and ethanol than you would if it was pure gasoline. Um, and uh, here's an example of the ethanol being used exclusively in IndyCar racing. And uh, the, the rather frightening thing about ethanol when it burns, um, it produces an almost invisible flame. And so often you see in IndyCar racing uh, that some of this material is spilt onto the hot engine parts and very soon the, uh, the, um, it spreads and the driver will jump out and he'll be uh, suffering from heat. Um, but you can't actually see ethanol burning, it's almost transparent. Um, one of the side effects of moving towards bioethanol for gasoline um, is the gasoline tanks themselves. And I'll just give you one example. The Italian uh, racing motorcycle company Ducati um, had made their uh, cost saving and weight saving by switching from aluminum gasoline tanks in their motorbikes to uh, composite. Um, this was a great idea until they started selling them in the United States um, and they found that the United States has one of the highest uses of bioethanol in the gasoline and this actually is absorbed into the composite plastic and it expands and uh, it expands to the point that the actual tank grows in size until it pushes up against uh, important safety parts of the motorbike itself. It's so serious that class action was made and all of those tanks had to be replaced with aluminum tanks. So that was a, a side effect of using ethanol that the Ducati Motor Company uh, hadn't realized um, when they were producing these lighter composite tanks. So 
how do we make alcohol? A very simple ancient process, naturally occurring. Um, you have to start off with a fuel, if you like, a sugar or starch, and then the magic ingredient is yeast. When that yeast is um, a microscopic single cell organism shown here in the middle picture. Um, and it occurs naturally throughout the world. And if you mix sugar or starch as a type of fuel um, with the yeast at the right temperature and humidity, then the yeast will ex grow and consume the fuel and make as a byproduct alcohol. It also produces carbon dioxide as a byproduct and it produces heat. So anybody who uh, brews their own beer, for instance, or makes wine um, in their own home will notice that the container where uh, this is fermenting actually gets warmer and warmer because the side effect is heat. So an example of uh, making beer would be barley, hops, water, yeast, and uh, it ferments and produces a beer. So basically the um, yeast is eating the sugar or the starch and converting it into byproducts, uh, particularly which we are interested in, which is ethanol. And it's interesting to note that um, there are different names for different yeasts used throughout the world, um, but the name for um, the most common yeast that's used for making alcohol is Cera Visae, which is a Latin name, and it was used in Gaul when the Romans were conquering Gaul. Um, the beer that they, the, the Gauls drank was called that, and it's made its way into a number of beer-related drinks throughout the world today using a Latin base. So Veso, for instance, in, uh, in Spanish or Mexican beer. So when did this process start and how did, it, how did we harness it? Well, we think that it started around about 120 million years ago. Why? Because the first uh, uh, materials like starches appeared in the form of fruit. And the fruits matured, apples shown in this picture, and they fell to the ground. And as they started to uh, decay, um, the organisms, the yeasts, that are naturally found in the soil, started to invade the rotting apples, and in producing, in doing so, uh, it destroyed the apple, of course, um, but it also allowed fermentation to take place, and this produced a small amount of alcohol. And if you ever collect rotting uh, fruit or apples um, from the ground and pick them up, you'll notice there's a distinctive smell and we say it's a rotting smell, but it's actually you know, alcohol being produced. And so this smell that's produced became fairly recognizable by animals. Um, and because it had been partly decomposed, it was also easier to digest. So rotting fruit became a staple of uh, animals uh, around about 100 million years ago. Interestingly, alcohol, as I said, kills bugs and it has an antiseptic property. Um, so often people put alcohol in water to try and uh, kill the bugs if you're in an area where the quality of the water isn't as hygienic as it is for in the United States, for instance, people will mix alcohol to try and kill the bugs um, and they also use um, other methods to kill the bugs but that's one, um, one system that people use for cleaning up bugs in water uh, if they're not too sure about the quality. So now we ask ourselves which creature and when um, with that creature start to enjoy the effects of uh, apples decaying and producing the side effect of alcohol. And uh, rather humorously, I'm showing this uh, tongue-in-cheek slide that um, an orangutan probably, along with many other monkeys, would have been the first people to experiment with uh, maturing, decomposing apples because uh, they're mostly um, fruit eaters and perhaps the first uh, drunken candidate on the planet was a monkey who had had too much of this uh, alcohol-laden fruit. The change into alcohol, which is a poison, being sort of accepted by the human body occurred around about 10 million years ago um, when humans, some humans, developed a mutation in their DNA and they produced a, a, a mutation called ADH4, which is a gene mutation, and apes were the first creatures to um, have this mutation. Um, this allowed new enzymes to be produced in the body, and these enzymes were able to combat the poison alcohol, ethanol, without ill effects. 
So all of a sudden, alcohol, which was a, a, a negative compound, um, could be absorbed by the, the early monkeys 10 million years ago. One of the side effects of alcohol being absorbed into brains is it has a, um, a very important um, f f effect on, uh, on how you feel. And this is because the uh, ADH4 gene uh, digesting ethanol without any bad effects has a side effect of releasing chemicals like serotonin, dopamine, and other endorphins. And these are absorbed into the bloodstream, of course, and they eventually make their way to the brain. And this affects how the brain functions. So we, in the early days, uh, alcohol had quite a significant effect on these uh, monkeys who had been quite surprised. If we then look at how that works on the human brain, um, it's often called alcohol consumption getting to the brain is often, often called the dopamine flood. Um, and uh, the general response to humans when alcohol goes into the bloodstream and into the brain um, via various pathways shown in this drawing, um, it makes the individual feel good. In fact, it uh, makes them feel overly happy. As we know, if we see people getting drunk, they're laughing and giggling. Um, they're less anxious than they were before. It lowers their inhibitions, which can be a bad thing, um, and it makes people feel closer together, which is why alcohol is so popular in parties and breaking the ice. The downside of this dopamine flood effect on a human brain is that it impairs certain bodily functions, and the most important of these are as follows. Um, it detracts from our ability to establish the distance between ourselves and objects, and particularly in driving. Um, we are not as conscious of how close we are to the vehicle in front or any other object. Um, if the more alcohol you consume, uh, the less you are able to identify how much distance there is between you and the car in front, and therefore it impairs your driving. You brake later, you get too close, etc. The other thing it does is uh, it affects your coordination. Uh, people who've had too much alcohol, they stumble, um, they drop things, they bump into things. So a function of distance uh, reaction times and coordination are negative features in humans. Um, also, an excessive amount of alcohol in the brain will actually um, wipe out memory. And people who've um, become drunk um, next morning can barely remember what happened because their short-term memory has been wiped out. And one of the serious things um, for impact on humans in terms of safety is um, we lose our sense of fear. So we will do things when we're influenced by alcohol that we'd never consider doing um, when we're completely sober. And uh, we can all think of examples that um, we thought we could jump down this flight of stairs or we, we could jump on a table and often this ends in desperately serious side effects um, because our fear of risk has been diminished. And in fact, so much so that people in the Middle Ages use alcohol to give to soldiers um, so that they wouldn't be as fear, fri frightened of going into battle. Now, when we look around uh, youngsters, we find them doing a, um, a popular habit of binge drinking, where they drink to excess and pass out. And we often think this is a new feature which is uh, affecting our society. Well, it's not new at all. Um, binge drinking is as old as history. Um, and uh, binge drinking has been shown in ancient Egypt three and a half thousand years ago where people have gone to a party and they're passed out and they're taken back to their rooms to sober up, um, even on the side of some tombs. And this lady here has been at a party and uh, she's drunk too much and she vomits and then the, her servant will collect that and often the individual will go back to drinking some more. So binge drinking um, has uh, been around for a long, long time. And it's interesting how people collect statistics, but uh, there is an um, analysis that says that in the West, um, young men will binge drink on average once a month. So you can check your own record on that. Um, alcohol has spread throughout the world. Um, it's in the Americas, it's in Africa, it's in Europe, in Asia, in China. So uh, early manufacture of alcohol to drink goes back uh, thousands and thousands of years.
So we're going to track um, where perhaps the oldest um, production of alcohol for consumption occurred. And it started off with civilization itself. If you remember, the definition of civilization comes from the word, Greek word civilis, meaning a city. So we stopped being hunter-gatherers and we started um, growing our own crops. Uh, we started uh, husbanding animals and staying put. And that concept of instead of following our food, hunter-gatherer style, we then became civilized, we set down roots, and we started living in villages, which then became towns, which then became cities, and so on. So we always start off our hunt for um, the origin of things by looking at when civilization started, and that was around about 12,000 BC, when we started to hybridize corn and wheat in the Middle East, and doing so you could produce heavier heads of these cereals, and you could make uh, bread from the flour that you grind. And so it was that the early uh, towns were able to grow crops and then make bread and have a stable uh, source of food, not relying on passing herds of animals. And so if we go back to 12,000 BC, um, the oldest uh, evidence of a bakery stroke brewery, and I mentioned both words because um, we're not quite sure what these uh, Natufian people, as they're called, um, were doing. They were the last of the pure hunter-gatherers, so they weren't actually living in towns. So this is 4,000 years or so before uh, civilization took root and people grew their own crops. Um, and so these people were harvesting natural um, grains, um, cereals, um, white, wild wheat and wild barley, um, and they would grind these uh, in the picture I've shown before in pots. Um, and they would either be making bread, or there's a belief that in fact they were going a stage further and they were making an alcoholic porridge. Um, the people did not live in these areas, these are transient centers, and the Natufian people were constantly moving. So this is before civilization proper started, um, and we conjecture what would they use the alcohol for, and the feeling was that they would do it for spiritual um, feelings, uh, feasts, etc., to the dead. And so these are effectively centers of spiritualism. The next uh, milestone was in southeast Turkey at a place called Gobekli Tepe, um, and uh, around about the beginning of uh, civilization, 10,000 BC, um, we've discovered this uh, ancient site, and we're astonished because these people are, in fact, still mostly hunter-gatherers, but here they have a very well-established base, um, not to live necessarily continually, but um, to visit. Um, and this is, again, probably a religious site, and it's very, very impressive. These are great stone pillars, 16 tons each, with a wooden roof, probably. And in this particular center, there are six barrel-shaped stone troughs. Each could hold 40 gallons, and it is felt that this was the uh, beginning of making alcohol. Um, how do you make it, of course? We've talked about the grasses can be used. Um, why do you drink alcohol for spiritual reasons? hallucinogenic effects, of course, are well associated with alcohol consumption. And maybe they felt, as people sometimes do today, that they can get in touch with the spirit world better by imbibing alcohol. Um, and eventually, these people settled down and lived in towns and uh, became more um, adept at making better quality hybrids. Um, so the period around 10,000 BC during the transition between hunter-gatherers and uh, living in cities um, is the transition probably where we went from making bread occasionally into going a stage further uh, and making alcohol from that bread. We have very, very strong evidence that by 7,000 BC, civilization was well established um, and some of the earliest uh, signs of alcohol production comes from China. In the south part of China, um, these jars were found, um, and nearby there was signs of people um, fermenting rice, honey, and berries, um, and millet, and producing al a simple alcohol um, uh, held in these particular containers. Um, in fact, we look to the Chinese records, um, and uh, the Zhao dynasty in China um, 
facts uh, explained why they were losing their battle against the neighbors um, because of too much alcohol consumption and they lost the mandate of heaven. As you know, Chinese spiritualism believes that the emperor uh, should no longer remain emperor if the mandate of heaven is withdrawn. And this is referred to in early Chinese writings due to alcoholic emperors. And in fact, all through history, Often leaders of nations um, um, have in fact been some of the worst offenders of excessive alcohol and drug um, use. Um, so much so was the alcohol problem in ancient China that um, there was an edict passed that you should only uh, take so much alcohol um, per week. Um, and uh, then they gave up a few hundred years later. They said, well, we cannot stop people getting drunk. It's beyond our power. Somewhat later, around about 200 BC, the Han Dynasty in China united um, China. And if you think about the world at this time, around about 200 to 100 BC to about 200 to 300 AD, the world was dominated by three great empires. In the west, there was Rome. In the east, there was the Han China. In the center was the Kushan Empire of northern India and Afghanistan. So the world was a very stable place relatively for a few hundred years. Um, and this was the transition that we saw in China, that uh, the beer, which had been uh, produced for hundreds and hundreds of years, um, was now being replaced by rice wines. Um, and the concentration of these wines became very significant, up to 20%. Um, and they added flavors, and in some cases they used them as medicines. Um, as I mentioned before, um, alcohol has for hundreds of years been used as a stimulant um, to uh, associate yourself with your spiritual ancestors, to, um, to strengthen your resolve before you go into battle, you know the word Dutch courage, and also when you've won a great victory, the Chinese would celebrate with alcohol, and if you had children being born or marriage, any excuse to drink alcohol in China. Marco Polo was one of the first Europeans. He left Venice and went with his uncle and his father, and they traversed um, by land all the way to Cathay, as it was called in those days, or China. They visited Burma, and then they were captured and considered to be spies, and the emperor of China thought that uh, Marco Polo had been sent by the Europeans to steal a state secret of how to make silk, because only the Chinese knew that it's a silkworm itself, it's spun silk. The rest of the world had no idea where silk came from. So they were locked up for some years and eventually um, managed to buy their way onto a ship and headed back through Malaysia and India and came back to Venice in Genoa. And of course, he published his books. And in the books, um, he mentioned things that he had noticed in China. Um, he said that uh, um, wine was consumed daily by most people. Um, it was taxed heavily. It's interesting, isn't it? This goes back to the Middle Ages, even those days. Uh, governments were taxing alcohol as a source of revenue. Uh, he mentioned the use of alcohol for inspiration, hospitality, and for those rice farmers who spend 12 or more hours a day, um, strangely, they would uh, drink wine to keep them going. The funny thing about Marco Polo, and some people suspect he never actually made it to China, he just uh, copied other people's reports. Um, he, in his book, did, never, did not mention anything about the most common <coughs> uh, habit to bind the feet of young girls to make them smaller. No mention of that, no mention of the chopstick, which is really odd because Chinese people, of course, even today, <coughs> extensively use chopsticks. And he never mentioned the Great Wall of China. So there are some people who felt that he uh, fictionalized his visit to China. China um, went into a very bad, dark period um, for a few hundred years when they had fallen behind the West and the colonial powers began to creep into their world. Initially trading, he was famous Britain trade on um, bringing in opium into China um, and uh, taking back silk um, and also porcelain. So the desire for greater trade with China uh, meant that the colonial powers began to um, encroach on the eastern seaboard of China itself. And all of the colonial powers, uh, including Japan and Russia and Germany, Britain and France, all took a slice of eastern China. And the Chinese had turned their back on the West, had not developed technology, and couldn't do anything about the, the armies that now occupied their country.
Um, I mention that because if you look where Germany established its commune, um, this area um, is a place called Qingdao. Um, and here is a brewery that the Germans set up because they found that the um, Chinese beer was not the same flavor as their own beer. And in 1903, they built this red brick brewery in Qingdao on the coast of China, which was a, a German colony. Um, and they called it Germania Brewery. And it's still there today. And uh, it's owned by an Anglo-German consortium. Um, and called the Anglo German Brewery, and which is now based in Hong Kong. But that brewery is over 100 years old. It's been changing hands for many years. The Japanese bought it one time and it became state owned and then bought by Budweiser, and now it's owned by a Chinese investor and it's worth about a billion dollars. Why do I mention this? Because if you go to uh, a bar which specializes in international beers, you can order a Chinese beer, which is branded Sing Tao, shown on the right-hand side. Very common here in the United States. Um, and that is a corruption of the town in which it's brewed, which is called Qing Dao. So next time you have a drink of Sing Tao beer, remember this went back to the Germans who built the brewery back in 1903. It has something like 15% of the Chinese market currently. Of course, everywhere in the world, people were making alcohol. And the oldest Egyptian evidence of making alcohol goes back to 5,000 years ago. This is the oldest brewery known in the world. It's, uh, there it is on the right-hand side. Uh, it could produce 300 gallons a day of beer. I have to say that it was very weak beer. It's probably only 1 or 2 percent alcohol. Um, but the Egyptians were very, very keen on making wine and beer, and they wrote on the text of the, wrote the text on the side of the tombs uh, that a, a man is perfectly contented when he is filled with beer. Interestingly, the um, drawings of making beer and the, some of the uh, artifacts which have been found always show it as a woman's work. Women made beer. Um, of course, eventually in time. The uh, concept of alcohol went into spiritualism, and uh, a god of the dead and wine was called Osiris. So he looked after the underworld, and he was also responsible for wine. And uh, the wine press on the right-hand side, this is the hieroglyph for a wine press. And when you died as an em a king in, or pharaoh of Egypt, then you left huge tracts of land um, which would grow crops, and those crops would be sold and the money would be used to continue worshipping the dead king. And uh, Khufu, um, who built the Great Pyramid in uh, uh, Giza in Cairo, uh, the tallest pyramid ever built, um, he actually, for 500 years after he died, uh, the money from his estates were used to pay for priests to come and pour wine um, into uh, an area in front of in a table where his effigy stood and he had his clothes changed and he was offered food every day three times a day and this went on for 500 years after he died in egypt in ancient egypt there are 17 different types of beer identified um, the most common by far is wheat beer and it was called um, by this hieroglyph on the right hand side we struggle to pronounce it, but it's probably pronounced Heket. And so this hieroglyph, clearly on the right-hand side, so it's a jar, and this refer, this is the word for beer in ancient Egyptian. When um, the area around the pyramids was opened up for um, excavation, Mark Lehner, um, uh, about 20 years ago, was given the responsibility to clear the sites just um, southwest of the pyramids in Giza. And he was... Uh, shocked when he found a town of 20,000 people which had been covered over by the sand and they've been excavating ever since and they have found breweries, they found bakeries and they wondered what were the purpose and they found rooms and they realized that this was the uh, town that the tomb and the pyramid workers used when they were building the structures for the pharaoh and they found pieces of stone chippings which had writing on them and uh, on some of the pieces of stone chippings it said how much each of the workers will get um, in terms of how much wheat how much bread each day and the ration was 
can you believe it? One and a third a gallon per day of beer was given to the workers when they finished their um, work for the day. Now you have to remember this is probably only about 1% alcohol so it's not quite as excessive as it may seem. You're all familiar with the Tutankhamun's tomb which was discovered by Howard Carter in 1922 and it's one of the uh, few tombs in ancient Egypt that had not been completely robbed in antiquity and uh, they were astonished to find that although it had been robbed uh, in part the um, it had been resealed and what they found were three wonderful rooms with treasures which of course are internationally famous. At the back, the, the fourth annex if you like, at the back of the three treasure rooms um, were found items that Tutankhamun wanted to reuse in the afterlife um, and of course there was food um, and there was wine and there was beer but he in his annex had nicely put into pots 24 different varieties of wine that he wanted to use when he came back from the dead and lived in the afterlife and he was 19 years of age when he died. Of course, alcohol being so well early established um, it also became a problem um, and we start to see Egyptian documents referring to moderation, abstinence um, and uh, they get lost control and they stopped defining drunkenness as a problem um, but parties, as you can see, um, would involve dancing, playing music and then binge drinking and these uh, two ladies here uh, combine two talents. They are dancers for the um, hosts and they're also serving beer to the, ho to the guests. If we now switch to India, um, one of the oldest civilizations in Northwest India was the Indus Valley Civilization, which was 5,000 years ago. Um, and there they brewed um, beer from wheat, sugar cane and grapes. Um, and they dedicated their drink to uh, the god Indra. Um, in 1500 BC, um, the Hindu texts began to be uh, written, the Vedic texts, and uh, here they talk about all manner of things to do with day-to-day -day living, bathing to remove uh, sins, etc., in this tank that you can see in the foreground, um, but also warned about intoxication. Um, but they had a very favorite uh, concoction, which they call Soma. Soma eventually turned into a god. There was a god called Soma, and Soma was a hallucinogen drink, um, and it contained um, all of the very exciting items listed at the bottom here. Um, ephedrine was there, honey, opiates, and alcohol, all mixed together was a drink called Soma, and in certain parts of the world you can still get this uh, rather strong concoction and you can buy Soma um, and uh, the idea being that when you drank this concoction um, your mind, your spirit was elevated and you could communicate with the gods. A really good excuse to get drunk isn't it? Um, India um, uh, later of course <coughs> was uh, colonized by Britain and they found that the local beers were not to their liking and so they st and from 1700 onwards they started to import something called pale ale IPA often today um, and this was a special product from England um, because in the shipping of pale ale from England to India in those days took six weeks and of course it was exposed to high temperatures um, and uh, often the beer would go off and so uh, the original pale ale contain, can you believe it, 16% alcohol, which is about the same as a strong wine today, because the alcohol, higher alcohol content helped it uh, preser be preserved while it was transiting from England through to India. Um, and by 1787, England was so well established in India that they started producing pale ale themselves, and it's called India Pale Ale, hence the word IPA. Um, lager beer, which is the most common beer these days throughout the world, um, came, came uh, somewhat later. Um, in 1978, lagers came into use in uh, India, and now, of course, they are the major source of beer. And there are great uh, beer houses spreading them all over um, India and now being exported. Um, and the famous beers uh, in India are shown here, the Taj beer, the Kingfisher beer, which went bust and then has restarted again. Um, and so you can find Taj and Kingfisher beer in any uh, Indian restaurant uh, in the United States today.
and in fact these brands have been taken over by the giant international um, uh, beer brands which control uh, most of the beer in the world today. If we now go to the Middle East, um, we see the Babylonians using beer um, uh, to worship um, and also and drank wine and offered to the gods, so the same as we've seen in other locations. Um, the excessive use of alcohol has always been a problem and the earliest form of law code written by a king called Hammurabi, which is surviving on a stele in uh, the Louvre Museum in Paris today, addresses the problem of alcohol. And he criticizes drunkenness, but he didn't apply any penalty to people who are habitually drunk. Um, and instead, he tried to control alcohol consumption in his country by raising prices and increasing taxes. Greece is no different. Uh, 2,000 years ago, the Greeks were making uh, wine, um, and by 1700 BC, well before the um, Parthenon, um, wine was commonplace and consumed uh, in the household. And of course, eventually, uh, just like other civilizations, they believed that alcohol was divine, and they called their god of wine Bacchus or Dionysus. The Romans used the same idea. Um, and by 700 BC, the worship of the god of wine and the Bacchanalian festivals, which were riotous, um, were common um, in Greece and then it spread on to um, Rome. And today, even in, in Athens, there is a um, Bacchus festival uh, in the fall where alcohol is almost given away free and uh, thousands and thousands of uh, teenagers rush to Athens for the Bacchanalian festival and all that it brings. Interestingly, we know quite a lot about how alcohol was shipped around the Mediterranean. Um, and the people who didn't drink alcohol were considered to be barbaric. Um, and uh, the map on the right hand side shows all the islands um, where they have found shipwrecks from ancient Greece. And in those shipwrecks, um, the actual containers um, um, were found containing at one time wine. And in total, um, 22 ships have been found containing containers which are called amphora. Uh, of course, empty, no wine left, uh, but, the, but the containers have survived, and these are 2,500 years old. Interestingly, the Greeks had a name for legitimizing uh, bad behavior, and they called them symposium. <laughs> Um, and this was for men only, and the idea was you'd get together one evening and you'd have good conversation, entertainment, and of course, some drinking as well. And there were rules for symposium, um, and uh, the rules were as follows. You rated how much alcohol you consumed in terms of the perils that it could cause. So you could have one bowl of alcohol during the symposium, and that would be a healthy consumption. Two um, was a bit more than just health, it was for pleasure. Uh, three, you could easily fall asleep. Um, but you had too much. If you had four balls, you could end up with having fights, uproars, uh, black eyes, uh, attacking policemen. And then if you had nine balls, you'd go mad and start throwing furniture. Um, and those were, the, those were the levels of alcohol consumption as measured by the ancient Greeks. Of course, great philosophers um, railed against the excessive use of alcohol in, in um in Greece, but some actually said it can be fine in moderate use and it can be beneficial in small quantities, but don't get drunk. And Xenophon wrote extensively on the uh, subject of alcohol and Plato. Also, he, he actually developed rules. He said no one under the age of 18 should be allowed to consume alcohol. And between 18 and 30, you should consume it in moderation. After 40, who cares? You're going to die anyway because most people hardly made it past 40. Hippocrates, the father of Western medicine, um, showed how alcohol could be used in medicine um, um, in the West. Now, one of the most famous drunks of all time was Alexander. Um, he and the Macedonians, who were considered barbarians by the Greeks, um, um, had a terrible habit of um, following the Dionysian cult. Um, and after um, a battle, for instance, or a period of conquest or political success, um, then they would celebrate. Um, they would celebrate a number of ways. First of all, his mother worshipped snakes, so you can see kind of society he came from. Um, and uh, she would tell um, Alexander from being a young boy 
that he wasn't the product of Philip, he, her, his father and her, that in fact Zeus snuck into her bed and as a result of that um, Alexander was born. And so he, she, her mother, his mother um, kept on telling him that Zeus is your father, not Philip, and, and you are destined to um, conquer the world. So important was wine to the Macedonians that his father, when he died, had tucked away in his grave his favorite wine, as we saw um, in the tomb uh, in ancient Egypt of Tutankhamun. The problem with the Macedonians were they took drinking to extreme, and it was quite reasonable behavior to get absolutely trashed for two or three days um, and then continue trying to run the world. A very good example of this was um, the fight that occurred between Alexander and his father, the king of Macedonia. At 19, um, he, his mother was concerned that Philip was going to marry another young wife, the fifth wife, and that if that um, wedding was successful, then any children that came of that would um, be in first line to the throne, and that would push Alexander out of the line of the throne. So at the uh, infamous wedding feast, where the announcement of the fifth wife uh, was made, um, both Philip of Macedonia, the king, was drunk, and so was Alexander. And they got into a fight, and Philip fell over uh, in drunken state, and Alexander made fun of him, and he was exiled. So he was kicked out of uh, Macedonia for six months, and then they became friends again. But this is not untypical of how the Macedonians celebrated. Rome, of course, absorbed this concept of drinking wine, and uh, they also had a god. Bacchus was the god of wine. Um, his nickname was the Liberator, because it frees, your, frees yourself from your normal control. Um, in Rome, um, slaves, peasants, nobles, and even women could, could drink alcohol. Um, and in fact, the pricing of alcohol um, uh, was well known and published and uh, was very inexpensive indeed, albeit that the actual alcohol concentration was somewhat less than we have today. As Rome expanded, it came into contact with other cultures and uh, when Britain was conquered, um, the Roman um, soldiers who were sent to Britain to eventually um, control the country and then later to build the famous uh, Hadrian's Wall and the Antonine Wall, um, they had been used to uh, consuming alcohol um, elsewhere <coughs> when they went to live in England. Um, uh, they were concerned that the amount of beer that was being sent up to the wall um, for the garrison was less than um, keeping his soldiers happy. So there's a good example of how beer was used to uh, pacify the, the boring nature of um, policing the Hadrian's Wall in the middle of winter. Um, Rome also, uh, like Greece, used alcohol in a spiritual form and on this wonderful column of Trajan uh, in the center of ancient Rome, um, here they are celebrating the, the defeat of the Dacian people, uh, the Germans as they call them, um, and uh, they are now drinking both beer and wine, celebrating the victory of the Dacians. Like the Greeks, the Romans shipped their wine um, in, around the countryside, and we found a number of uh, vessels which have run aground uh, in the Mediterranean, um, off Spain particularly, and off Italy. Um, and you can see how these amphora um, were stacked, and this ship went down and stayed pretty much intact. And you can see that um, the amphora were, were stored vertically and, and held in clamps and this is a ship that was brought up um, just off Genoa. As I mentioned, um, the cost of um, items of common consumption were identified in the Roman world, um, and in the Lupinars, which is uh, the brothels of Pompeii, um, the actual relationship between having access to a lady in these establishments was linked to uh, wine. So uh, the cost of spending some time with a lady in a lupinar was equivalent to four glasses of wine. So we, we have a very interesting parallel there. If we go uh, into the New World, down to Mexico, of course we come across the famous pulque, which is based on a fermented agave plant, which is shown on the right-hand side. Um, and uh, 
Bouquet has become less popular as time goes on. Beer, Mexican beer, of course, has become uh, internationally famous and has, has replaced it largely. The Maya, which are alive and well in central Mexico, many people say, what happened to the Mayans? Well, they just went back to living in the woods when the central government failed. And the Mayans uh, are still there and they speak Mayan. So they haven't disappeared. They just have uh, you know, stopped living in the great Mayan cities. And they drink boche, which is based on tree bark fermentation. And here are a few examples of bottles of boche, which are uh, consumed there. Um, many societies have used um, palms, the seeds of palms, um, to make alcohol. And uh, the most famous, of course, is the toddy palm, shown here on the right. And its seeds make very good beer. Um, and if you know the expression, um, I'm having a hot toddy, uh, the word toddy comes from this particular um, palm beer coming from there. Um, let's go to Germany, and uh, we all love Oktoberfest. And uh, how did that start? Well, in 1810, Crown Prince Ludwig of Bavaria invited everybody in his realm to celebrate. Um, and uh, here's a picture of them in one of the earliest um, Oktoberfests. Um, and about six million people today will travel to uh, Bavaria to celebrate Oktoberfest and most of the people are local or southern Germany and the traditional time is October, September the 16th to October the 3rd. Um, the Germans are very organized and have had high standards in manufacturing from the early days and in 1516 um, they had established what could be used to make beer and the purity that the beer had to have to be able to sell it. So they controlled the, qual <clears throat> the quality of the water, the hops, the malt and the yeast. From 500 years ago, uh, quality control was alive and well in German beer. Interestingly, moving away from alcohol just for a minute, there have been other drinks which have caused problems in society and uh, we today of course uh, just accept coffee as a, a, a as a beverage um, but of course where did it come from and coffee originated from Ethiopia and the legend is wonderful probably completely untrue but it's a great story that a goat herder called Kaldi noticed that um, his flock of goats were nibbling at a coffee tree and eating the berries and afterwards they would become very frisky and that's the origin of coffee being discovered around about 800 AD. Well it spread out of Ethiopia to Yemen um, and of course the Arab Arabica bean is very very common because it comes from Arabia then it passed into Egypt Persia and Syria and eventually made into made its way to Istanbul and from there the trade led to Amsterdam and into Venice. So coffee by 1500 was growing throughout um, the continent of Europe. A Turkish uh, resident in London in 1652 decided to open a coffee house um, and uh, within a week he was selling 600 coffees a day. So eat your heart out Starbucks. And of course, this, uh, this is attractive to all of the uh, folk living in London. And one of the most popular customers at this coffee house was Samuel Pepys, who would come and talk to his friends and talk about what was going on. And, and that was the source of his famous diary. By 1660, only a few years later, there were 63 coffee houses in London. Um, and the consumption of coffee was now considered to be a concern to society. Um, and people would drink coffee and alcohol and so under Puritan rule um, during the period when the um, Charles had his head cut off and um, the, the country was run by um, people who had a very dim view of flamboyant clothing and excessive behavior um, we called them Puritans and they of course moved across the Atlantic um, to um, the colonies um, they banned alcohol from going to coffee houses and banned um, women from going to coffee houses. And, al and coffee was considered by the government uh, um, as an evil and dangerous drink. But it was not to be ended because coffee was so popular that it became a meeting point as it is today. Coffee houses is where people meet. Uh, if you go to a coffee house in Fort Myers, you have people um, 
sitting, reading, you have them doing, uh, the university students are there working away, and so it's not just a place to go and get coffee, it's also a meeting place. And so it was that coffee houses in London um, became um, places where people of common interest would gather and chat. Um, and uh, the early coffee houses in London have been preserved. This one on the right is Jonathan's Coffee House, which actually attracted people who began to buy and sell stocks in companies. And in fact, this was the first London Stock Exchange was based in the Jonathan's Coffee House. There it is in 1680. Um, a few years later, uh, another coffee house run by the Lloyds uh, people um, attracted people who wanted to buy insurance for their ships. And so it became the place to go to to get ship insurance. And out of that grew the Lloyds Insurance Company in London. Interestingly, the switch from drinking tea to drinking coffee in America happened around about the time of independence. And before independence, tea was by far the biggest beverage. But after the Boston Tea Party and taxation, etc., um, it was almost protested that we should drink in the new world, the new America. United States should not be drinking English tea. And they started to import coffee, um, which could be grown locally. Going back to alcohol for a minute, um, the production of cheap alcohol became um, a problem in the 18th century. Before that, the English soldiers fighting in the infamous Thirty Years' War, around about 1618 to 1640, um, had noticed that uh, the um, soldiers were being given gin um, before they went into battle to reduce their fear of getting injured or killed and this became known as Dutch courage, and it's still used today. Well, gin became the alcohol of choice. It was very cheap to make um, and easy to distribute, and it became super popular um, after King William III, who was Dutch, uh, introduced it into England when he came over and became King William in 1689. In the next 50 years, gin got out of control. It was cheap, low duty, and it became the drink of choice in London and elsewhere. By 1730s, the average Londoner was drinking three pints of gin a week. It was out of control. So much so that a few years later, the Gin Act was published where you could only um, buy gin in a licensed public house and the tax was increased. Um, this was so unpopular that the riots had it repealed and the 1751 Hogarth is showing um, females living in atrocious conditions and squalor uh, all day long looking after their kids with very little money they would um, take gin to make their lives easier and it became known as mother's ruin and so in 1751 finally they acted to stop um, gin becoming so prevalent high taxes beer was introduced and tea was introduced instead of drinking gin now we're going on to the impact of alcohol in modern times. And the nutritionist Darby in 1976 um, made a very good observation that the alcohol is considered to be a problem because the people who consume a moderate amount, um, they are overshadowed by those who abuse the consumption of alcohol and gives alcohol a bad name. They get a disproportionate amount of attention, he wrote. Um, and so it was that the... Um, um, the review of what is the right amount of alcohol and should it be controlled began to grow in the West. If you take an overview of uh, the planet, this map shows you where alcohol is consumed most. And this is um, lumping all forms of alcohol into one particular measure. And you can see where the greatest consumption is, which is in, uh, in Russia and uh, in Western Europe. Some, there's a large number of people in this world who don't drink alcohol at all. The latest survey found that 30% of people who live in the United States do not drink any alcohol. And half of the world, it's estimated, has never drunk alcohol. But the people who do drink to excess are causing a number of issues socially and health-wise. Um, and it is estimated that in the United States, alcohol abuse kills around about 100,000 people each year through disease or through accidents. And to treat alcoholic uh, victims is costing nearly 300 billion years dollars per year. It's a very significant problem, much greater than the uh, abuse of drugs by, by comparison.
The country that becomes infamous as having the most amount of alcohol consumption is Belarus, which is one of the USSR um, states. Um, and the average consumption there for a person over the age of 15 is nearly five gallons of alcohol a year. Well, alcohol and driving became an issue when cars became more common. And around about 1906, New Jersey, seeing that um, the, the number of cars on the road was increasing and the deaths from drunken drivers was becoming a concern, um, decided to pass the first law um, relating to drink. Um, and uh, they said that if you are found um, in charge of a vehicle, um, you will be fine and drunk you will be fined $500 um, or spend 60 days in jail. But there was no definition of what drunk meant, so it's up to the interpretation as to whether somebody was drunk or not, which is difficult to police. California jumped in directly after that, and many other states introduced this uh, um, concern over alcohol and driving. Um, the first step that people had to make was identifying what is an acceptable amount of alcohol in the blood um, that, to, that would lead to being uh, drunk under the influence. And it was only in 1910 that New York finally came up with a standard of 0.15 grams per milliliter and said above that um, you are uh, you're drunk in charge of a vehicle. After the First World War there was a Protestant backlash to alcohol consumption, particularly in rural areas. Um, where they saw that alcohol was impacting badly on families, alcoholic um, families were suffering, violence was increasing, uh, the men were going to saloons, uh, and so on. It was generally considered to be a negative influence in society. And hard to believe, but in 1920, the 18th Constitution Amendment was made, and it became illegal to make, transport, or sell intoxicating liquors in the United States of America. Unfortunately, this prohibition only drove alcohol consumption underground, and it also opened up um, the opportunity to make money out of the illegal um, production and sale of alcohol, which meant that organized crime jumped in terms of uh, their influence on the United States. And they fed this underground desire for alcohol. Um, and murders rose and sales tax were lost and overall um, it was considered that uh, this is going nowhere but 13 years later they finally finally repealed the Prohibition Act. And this is a picture showing how happy people were that the 18th Amendment was repealed in 1933. The voting age in 1971 in the 26th Amendment went from 21 to 18 years of age. And this was ratified by uh, all of the states in three months. So it reduced the voting age to 18. The question then rose, is that the age at which you should allow youngsters to drink? Um, and between 1970 and 75, 29 states lowered the drinking age, like they did for the voting, from 21 to 18. And that was the trend. So at 18, you could vote, at 18, you could drink. Well, that changed dramatically in 1980, when a lady called Candy Leitner, 13-year-old daughter Carrie, was walking along the street and she was run over by a drunken um, driver in California. Worse still was this driver had been arrested for having a DUI shortly beforehand. And this tragedy led to a lot of publicity and uh, she went nationwide. Uh, movies were made about it. Um, in 1984, finally, the, the country decided to change the age of uh, legal drinking from 18 back up to 21. Now, they didn't do it in a, in a national um, federal law. It was done rather cleverly that every state had to decide what was a suitable age for allowing youngsters to drink. Um, but if you didn't choose 21, then you would lose federal funding for road building. So all the states followed suit. And in 1987, despite protest, the Supreme Court held that uh, 21 is the age, the earliest age you can drink. Well, sadly, after that change, uh, there was a desperately sad event where the, the deadliest uh, fatalities in American history took place where 
a farm worker drove the wrong way under the influence and hit a, a school bus and 63 kids from a church outing were affected, 27 died. And that's the worst incident of drunken driving in the United States even at the present time. So what about the rest of the world? Um, well, the United States and the UK um, are considered to be very lax in the sense that um, there are ways to get around DUIs and the level at which uh, DUI is effective varies dramatically. So if you look at the yellow countries, United States and Britain, um, 0.08 is the blood alcohol limit above which you're considered to be uh, a DUI. Um, but if you look at the other countries, they're much more stringent. You know, they get less to 0 0.05, 0 0.04, 0 0.03, and so on. And in some countries, any alcohol present is a, uh, is a crime. And so much so that in Scandinavia, um, people do not drink and drive. They, um, they will take taxis to the restaurant and taxis back home again. Um, so they take it very seriously indeed. And people around the rest of the world think that we in, in the United States and the UK have too, too liberal a view on DUIs. The rest of the world, um, though, has a different philosophy with regard to drinking age, which is ironic, um, because Iceland and Japan allows um, anybody over 20 uh, the rest of the world is typically 18. France is down at 16, and Italy, well, we should not talk about Italy, because if you go to Italy, you can see uh, people well under the age of 16 drinking wine and family events. That's just their particular culture. Why is the United States uh, so high um, in terms of 21? By far the highest age to drink. Um, and of course, it's a big issue because 18,000 people died in 2015 in alcohol-related accidents, and it was equivalent, uh, contributed to 30% of all the traffic deaths. So, drunken driving is, is, is an issue which is in the forefront of our minds all the time. The issue really doesn't doesn't boil down to the age at which you can drink. It's the blood alcohol limit. And there are many people who think that the blood alcohol limit for DUI should be dropped dramatically um, in the United States. And to give you an example of how this varies from person to person, um, here's an interesting chart um, where, a little bit hypothetical, this is uh, comparing men and women of uh, the same weight. So fundamentally, you've got a man 180 pounds and a woman of 180 pounds. And scientists have done this research. Uh, the limit, of course, in America is 0.08 grams per 100 milliliters, which is relatively high for the rest of the world. So how do you get to that limit? And that's the important thing, because we don't take blood tests, of course. We have to use, how, use it in comparison how much we actually consume. And so if you take one drink as a glass of beer or a glass of wine, um, then one drink would make a male of that, size, of that weight 0.02% and a woman 0.03, two drinks 0.04, 0.05. So at three, anybody who drinks more than, any female who drinks more than three drinks um, are likely to be over the limit and for men four. Why is this the case? And in fact, it gets more interesting because this isn't a period of one hour, by the way, because the body destroys alcohol. So if you take in one unit of alcohol, Typically, after about an hour, that alcohol is, is destroyed by the, the body. But women have more body fat by definition and less body water, so the concentration of alcohol in women is higher, which is why this is remarkable that they become inebriated with less alcohol than men, or the same weight. But the interesting thing is that women's metabolism is different from men, and they destroy alcohol faster than men, so they sober up more quickly than men according to the research. To put things in perspective, to finish off, um, it is true to say that alcohol-related deaths and alcohol-related costs are much more s significant than drug addiction. And this may f surprise many people, um, but as I said before, 100,000 people die from alcohol-related um, illnesses or driving every year in the United States, which is greater than the population of Fort Myers and it's getting worse. Um, more and more people are drinking more and more. So between 2001 to 2013, there was a 30% increase in people who drink four to five drinks per day. Not everybody, of course, but those people who drink could be drinking that level. 
Alcoholism as measured by their medical profession in the same profession of the same period has gone up from 8% to 13% of the population are alcoholic. Now, there are different definitions of functioning alcoholic, non-functioning alcoholic, but that's the broad definition, which is equivalent to 30 million people in the United States are considered to be alcoholics. You compare that to drug addiction, that's 10 times greater than drug addiction in the United States. And there are certain segments of society who suffer more seriously or more um, negatively than others. Uh, older people and uh, African Americans. Um, and now the incidence of women's drunkenness is increasing dramatically. Um, so there are various social trends which are being observed um, throughout the country. The World Health Organization say across the planet, three million people die of alcohol, 6% of all deaths, and it's prevalent in lower income groups. And Europe, as I mentioned, that graph has the highest alcohol consumption um, and deaths in the world. And so what do we do practically to finish this story off? How do we protect ourselves and others from driving under the influence? And a new device has occurred uh, and been tested and now accepted in 50 states since 2012 where you can breathe into a very inexpensive device, it's $200, it's wired into your car, and you breathe into the device, as you can see this lady's doing here, and if you're below the limit, it allows you to start the ignition. If you're above the limit, it won't allow you to start the car. And that is being recommended in many states uh, for people who have a history of uh, drinking over and driving over the limit. So, that brings my story to a conclusion. Yes, Alcohol has many positive uh, facts, factors, but it also has a number of very, very negative factors, and it's a, it's a challenge for us in the modern period to try and get that balance right. So I thank you for your attention. I look forward to seeing you in my next talk. Goodbye. Cool. That was an hour and ten? Yes. Okay. Is that all right? It should be about an hour.